Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Fiber Festival. My name is Michelle Kasperzak, and I'm the host and moderator that will take you on this journey, this hybrid conference, uh, over the next two days. Um, over the next two days, we're going to have conversations for everyone interested in art and research that pushes boundaries and intertwines technology, ecology, and society. The focus during these two days is not to demonstrate the planetary state of emergency that we're all well too aware of, but to explore strategies and possible scenarios to adapt or achieve more desirable futures. Over five sessions, we invite a multitude of perspectives from artists, activists, and scientists that allow us to look at environmental crises and related social challenges in new and hopefully insightful ways. This year, Fiber is looking for new insights, non-human ways of seeing, and possible strategies in order to perceive our world in alternate ways. What opportunities are open to artistic making and thinking to contribute to the transformation of Western culture from extractive to sustainable? This is just one of the many questions that we're going to be exploring together over the next five sessions. So with nothing further uh, from me for that introduction, I'd like to open up this, uh, this subject of instability, our festival theme with uh, festival director Jarl Skolp, who will come join me on the table here and take his mask off and be part of the table. <laughs> Welcome, Jarl. Welcome, everybody, to the Brackegrond. Yes, our, welcome our, to the Brackegrond, yes. Yeah, our home since 2000, our home. 2008. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fiber is 10, and this is the fifth uh, anniversary, no, yeah? Of the of the uh, festival, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was supposed to be a very celebratory moment yes. uh, with a lot of performance evenings and a lot of kind of packing people in small spaces. <laughs> <laughs> that went very differently. Um, but we're super happy to be here. Um, uh, I would like to thank all our supporters, our partners, uh, for making this happen. Especially the team they have been working really hard on the on the festival, um, and it's great to be here. Um, we thought, um, well, we started um, in 2018 a series called, uh, uh, event series, uh, where we had an event called Terra Fiction, which you also yes. happily moderated yes. with us. Um, that was the start for us to start thinking about topics between ecology and technology. And for the, us this year, we really wanted to address the topic of climate change. Uh, why? Because we think it's, uh, we don't have to prove now that climate change exists. We're living in it. You could see it very physically, and this global, uh, the global south have been already experiencing for decades. Um, but what is very hard is to grasp it and to understand it for a lot of people. So what we thought is like, if, uh, if we address this through the lens of our, the arts, then we can tell very different stories about climate change. And this is what we try to do in the festival. Um, so we, we take it apart. and. As uh, the eco-philosopher Timothy Morton says, it's, it's kind of a hyper-object, uh, uh, a system or a thing or a process that's so big that you cannot grasp it through uh, a normal understanding of time, space, uh, location. Um, so what we do in this festival is to, uh, to give these perspectives through uh, artistic uh, practices. That's uh, what we try to do. Uh, and we created a one and a half day conference uh, completely COVID-proof, <laughs> so we're also here with a crowd of almost 30 to 40 people, which is very different than we do, used to do. Much smaller and, uh, yeah, appropriately spaced out and all, uh, all safety considerations taken uh, into account. Um, we also have the, the smoke machine that's new this year, yeah, <laughs> very yeah. cool. So we have some atmosphere, it's just a very different atmosphere than, than normal for us, yeah. yes. Yeah, we, what we did when uh, we proposed the festival from May, we decided, well, if we're going to do something, if we're going to do something. And then we thought, okay, our theme is instability. So if anything needs to be happening, we have to become unstable ourselves and adapt and change something. And we came up with this whole format of like a, a space in between a, uh, a conference and a streaming studio, um, where also we bring in the online audience, which is uh, coming uh, from many parts of the world now, which is a new advantage, I would mm -hmm. say, yeah. um, and present to you a one and a half day uh, hybrid conference. and. Uh, it's so quite challenging, but very, very nice to do. Yeah, maybe we should just talk a little bit about how it will go. So we have yeah. five sessions, um, and each session has a sort of hybrid mix of speakers who will be here on the table with us, uh, as well as, uh, well, on the screens around us and coming beaming in from all over the globe. 
Um, and our audience is also partially with us and partially yep. all over the globe watching the, the stream with us. And we'll be able to take questions uh, at the end of each session from the audience that's here with us and also from the stream uh, through Rianne, who will be the voice of the uh, online audience for us. So that's uh, really nice. So that's a little bit so everyone has a feeling of how things will go uh, tonight and tomorrow. Um, yeah. But uh, to dive a little bit more into the, into the theme, Jarl, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the, you know, I mean, the motivation is clear. The motivation is the crisis that we're undergoing that is without question now, as you say. Uh, we can't deny this uh, yeah. any longer. But uh, it seems there's crisis upon crisis, and this creates layers that are difficult to unpack. Um, yeah. So we're going to take it apart piece by piece. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like what we try to do also within our exhibition, which is running at all our time, we try to give a lot of different perspectives. Uh, we're in no way complete because it's almost impossible to be complete in this kind of moment. Uh, we're also not giving full answers to everybody. It's more that we try to give a lot of these kind of stories and perspectives a space where we can get together and talk about them. And I think I'm, I, I was very drawn uh, to what one speaker uh, that's coming later in the post-human territory session is talking about, Holly Jim where her book After Geoengineering uh, focuses on uh, the moment that we're in that some type of technologies might even be useful to, to uh, implement in our combat to climate change but we have to also address what comes after this so now we're in, stuck in this moment in time where we're really looking for solutions and things to battle this but kind of like what comes after this kind of struggle that we're in and this is, this is also about futures that we need to, to talk about. And I'm not saying specifically futures, because it cannot be a future from one perspective. Mm -hmm. we're, that's, that's a world that we never will return to, I think. I hope mm -hmm. so. I think it's also clear uh, dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, especially to see that uh, it's whatever solutions that we find uh, as, as human society, we go a little bit forward and then we, we keep trying to creep backward into what we thought was normal from before. And you know, it's, it's a little bit of give and take and you know, shuffling back and forth towards the futures. Yeah, yeah the futures, yeah. <laughs> and I'm also very happy to, for our guests that I already see are joining us. Uh, Anapa Suzanne, mm -hmm. welcome. Great that you can join us. Um, and, and with, with our speakers uh, being with us, we, we have an opp opportunity to share uh, many of these different types of practices and, and, f and, and uh, stories. So um, I hope with this that we can leave this festival uh, uh, with a mode of listening and listening to the world around us and listening to the changes uh, and then maybe think about them and then move forward. Because interestingly enough, when we started writing the text and the context for this uh, event, we always had this kind of sentence that, uh -huh, and then we moved to bright futures. <laughs> and then easily within the first month, we took at the brightness of it because yeah, I'm not saying that we don't have to be optimistic, but it's, it's very naive to start thinking about brightness now. I think first we have to kind of listen and, and, and feel kind of where we are. And this is where the arts and design also comes in. Yes, could help us confront reality. And instead of, um, I think also we can't help but, um, you know, we, we want to look for a solution. It's a pragmatic, it's a pragmatic yeah. impulse. Um, but uh, maybe the solutions are coming in bits and pieces. We have to also develop a kind of, I think, patience with our process as we kind of stumble towards better, brighter, yeah. dare I say, futures. Yeah. yeah, and also I think there comes also a new sensibility uh, mm -hmm. towards things. And that's also where I think also people working with uh, audiovisual media materi materials, also this, this new sensibility of the world that we're part of and that we're suddenly waking up that was very different, uh, where nature and culture aren't divided and are part of the, the same world, where technology is also part of, of nature and is not outside of that sphere. And that uh, uh, has to, yeah, we have to do a lot of kind of creating a sort of cognitive shift, I would say. Mm -hmm. And not to uh, put you on the spot too much with a, a big reflection on the past, but of course th there are a couple of milestones here, the fifth anniversary, the tenth anniversary. Yeah. Looking back on, on, I mean, this has always been at the heart of the, the fiber ethos, I would say, is trying to, to look at uh, things analytically, not too nostalgically, uh, pragmatically, but also with a, a sensitivity to the nuance. Um, and I see that also coming through here. Is there any other bits of the thinking into the festival theme that you want uh, people to be aware of before we dive in? That's a good question. Um, 
I think that's what I would like to emphasize on is that it's a starting point for us every time a festival. And you put so much energy with the team and the research, like Rianne and I have been putting together the program also. Um, and then you find out uh, in the old way that mm -hmm. you were running to the new festival and the, the themes were kind of abandoned and then you would start something new. But now we've decided to kind of stick with this and for the next kind of half, one and a half year, kind of be in this space and also continue the conversations. We have been also talking about what it means to be a slow festival that is going over like this longer time span instead of like the model of where every year you had to kind of redo yourself mm -hmm. completely. So that's maybe what I would like to share that this is kind of a starting point also for us. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, pressure, isn't there, to always be yeah, presenting something completely new or stimulating audiences with completely new things. But very often, uh, what's important is to also keep returning to in important topics. It doesn't have to just stop and, uh, you know, fly all over the place to, to different things all the time. Yeah. We have to keep returning to the pressing questions of the time. So, yeah. Great. Um, shall we then begin with yeah. the first session? Yeah. Super happy. Thanks, Jarl. Thank you very Let's much. Give him a little applause. <laughs> we're used to 200 people in the room. It's a little difficult, but we're, we're so far so smooth. So here we are now in uh, session number one, uh, Becoming Unstable. Uh, this session looks at bigger questions surrounding social and planetary instability. Uh, an instability caused by ongoing climate change, social inequality, and of course, the reality of COVID-19. How do we deal with the moment in which we find ourselves? What cognitive and physical actions can art, design, and music offer to help us imagine and design a new society? These are the broad stroke questions for this uh, panel. And I'm joined uh, here in real space by uh, two people on the table, Darko Lagunas and Theon Carels, and uh, virtually by uh, Suzanne Daliwal and Anab Jain. Um, and we'll start with uh, Darko and Theon, who are presenting together in a kind of uh, hybrid uh, collaborative um, presentation. So, uh, welcome. Thank you, hello. Uh, yeah, um, I shall start. My name is Darko Lagunas. I'm an uh, urban sociologist. Um, so I focus on uh, the human nature relationship. I do a lot of field work, especially in the landscape. Uh, as an urban sociologist, that's maybe a little bit strange, but uh, yeah, so uh, focusing on, especially from that perspective as an urban sociologist, you see a lot of things which uh, uh, are quite interesting. Um, my work uh, is uh, so uh, field work, uh, uh, ethnographic field work mostly, and in collaboration a lot with artists and also with yeah indigenous perspectives. I would say yeah indigenous communities. Yeah. I'm uh, Teun Karelsen. I'm an artist, and being an artist has always been kind of a way to avoid uh, certain, to fall into a particular, um, how do you say, um, occupation or, uh, and it worked out so far. And um, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to work in landscapes and to explore things, uh, topics that are relevant to culture in those spaces because um, I think Many of the most pressing questions lie outside of our front door in the spaces that we share with other kinds of beings. So that's, that's been my uh, trajectory so far. And I make um, fieldwork programs that, um, that look at specific topics or themes and then try and work with people from different backgrounds and different uh, so this can be uh, backgrounds uh, in, as in science, arts, or otherwise, but also backgrounds as in uh, European and non-European, uh, and also age. So trying to mix things up. Yeah, um, so we wanted to start with an example, um, which is uh, actually um, uh, start, starting to stand on one leg. Um, the point is, um, Balance is not the same as stability. So um, we have, uh, it's, it's sort of a metaphor for how we think in Western society and uh, how Western rationale works. Um, but um, when you look uh, at the etymology of stability, you see that this word actually means a very constant situation, uh, very stable, uh, controlled, uh, fixed. 
Uh, whereas balance is something you have to work for. And um, when you stand on one leg, I think it's a nice example when, uh, because when, for example, when you stand on two legs, you, you think you are in control and actually the situation looks quite controlled. But if you stand on one leg, then the situation changes. When you look at the pressure points from your feet, for example, then you see that this is, you're actually falling over the whole time and you're sort of uh, trying to not fall over and correcting actually. And this is the work you are doing to, um, to keep that balance in place. And uh, I think it's a nice metaphor for how we see this uh, sort of, uh, yeah, illusion of, of, of control or stability that we are in. Um, yeah. My first sort of uh, thought when about stability or, or the lack thereof is um, it made me think of the documentary that uh, Adam Curtis made, uh, All Watched Over by Machines of Love and Grace. And in it, two brothers are, um, are um, ecologists and they are studying the prairie habitat of North America. And they're, they're looking for the balance in nature. They're trying to measure it and they're so they decide, okay, let's track all the grazers in this uh, prairie. See what they're up to. Maybe we'll find balance in that kind of system. Uh, they don't really find it. So then maybe we track also what they eat, all the plants. And then they still don't find the balance and then they include all insects. And so it completely spirals out of control until one brother ends up, I think, uh, committing suicide and the other one goes to a mental institution. Uh, the point of that clip was that uh, they were looking for balance in nature and the question is, does that exist? Or is it just a dynamic system? Or is it maybe just too complex to, uh, to grasp, right? Yeah. And um, I guess the way humans uh, deal with change um, is through culture, where we, uh, the experience this, that an in individual has and what an individual learns over a lifetime is shared and combined. And um, This happens in humans, but it also happens in animals. So uh, animals teach each other a lot. And um, there's more and more you hear the, the, that the word culture is also used for animals and this particular picture of the chimps is because uh, of an article that wrote about how it's becoming more difficult for chimpanzees to share their knowledge between, you know, over longer distances because, they're, because the groups are isolated. Humans have put in between big roads or other infrastructure. So our, inter our interventions as humans has sort of is inhibiting them to deal with change in a way. So uh, the thought would be, is it interesting to expand world heritage sites to, uh, to also include animal heritage sites? Hmm. It's just, I think, time for the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to say something uh, from Tim Ingold, uh, which probably a lot of people know him. Um, but uh, yeah, so taking uh, change actually as a given uh, in the landscape or in, in, in nature, uh, by lack of a better word maybe, um, uh, Tim Ingold says that cultural variations, uh, they actually uh, come from the variations in skill more than uh, uh, anything else. Hmm. and that skills uh, are not like inherited by bio biologically, but uh, you obtain them through, well, maybe cultural heritage, um, but mostly by training and uh, practice in an environment. Hmm. So you need sort of this connection with the landscape mm -hmm. if you would want to have uh, uh, yeah, the, the skills to deal with the changes in that certain landscape. Uh, and the point, uh, yeah, actually here is that uh, here in Western, or maybe better said modern society, uh, we are, in most cases, we are living in urban contexts. Uh, and these urban sort of uh, contexts or environments are 
pretty much disconnected, alienated from what the planetary needs are, to, so to speak. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, um, yeah, so this urban this, this disconnection between uh, 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 the, the urban context, the urban environment, and the skills that you obtain through through practice and training in this environment. Uh, are not necessarily uh, um, um, uh, yeah, well the skills you would need to 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 deal with changes in the landscape mm -hmm. or in nature. So that disconnection um, uh, is 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 problematic, uh, perhaps. Um, and um, a lot of things happening. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so you said so Tim Ingold says something about it, yeah. but uh, you're showing a picture uh, from Chile. Yeah. That's your own practice. Yeah. yeah, so this is a research, or this is part of a field work I was doing in, in, in La Rocanilla in southern Chile together with the uh, Valley of the Possible. Um, and the thing is that the connection with the land, for example, with the Mapuche uh, uh, people, at least the Pehuenche, some of the Pehuenche Mapuche communities where I was, that connection is still really strong. So there's a tree, and this tree is like the, the symbol, like we have Jesus on a, on a, on a stick, on, a, on the cross, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus on a stick. Jesus on a stick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but, but they have a tree, and this uh. tree uh, is like the symbol of their religion and the yeah. centerpiece of, of their sort of uh, cosmology. Um, so, and, and, and this tree, yeah, is connected to the landscape, of course, and it, it, it is at this moment it's in, in danger of extinction because of cl uh, climate change. Mm. So this, this shows sort of an example of, 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 of this connection. They have to protect this tree because it's really deeply rooted in their, in mm. their society, in their mm. way of being. So that is the difference between, yeah. Um. I'm from Zeeland, and uh, um, the, uh, we were there to do uh, interviews with people about the future of the place, um, with sea levels rising and the land becoming lower. Uh, w these dikes have been around for a couple of centuries, but nobody's sure how long that will last now. And um, it made me think, uh, we visited... Um, Ria Geluk, and this is her finger pointing at her, the house where she used to live. And in 1953, there was a big flood, and she's pointing out where they sat on the roof. And um, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the language uh, about these infrastructures is about um, control. So the dikes that we've built give us control, but uh, these kinds of incidents show that uh, it's maybe not so much control. The, the, maybe the dikes are a show of strength, human strength, our ability to act, and then our ability to control maybe less so. And next slide, Dargo. <laughs> and um, this illustrates uh, what happened to the, the whole west of uh, Holland, actually. Um, the picture on the left is uh, 500 years before uh, Christ, and all that sort of brownish stuff is uh, moorlands, so peats. And um, you can see that the, 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 the rivers that flow, especially where I'm from, Zeeland, you know, that's, that's not a very big river. There are no islands, it's just it's a landmass, and it's quite stable because of these moorlands. They they um, they collect the water. They're very sort of stable. But we come there, and as humans, I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, we start to uh, uh, dig for this peat and burn it for all kinds of purposes. And then, two thousand years later, you get the picture on the right where there are suddenly islands and uh, quite significant rivers in a delta shape and. Then humans come and we, we put in the dikes and uh, we think we've brought stability, but we forget that we've removed it before. And I didn't know that. I didn't know until I did this research. You know, I have lived there forever and my family has lived there forever, but I didn't know that this happened. I thought those islands were natural <laughs> and that our dikes brought us stability. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so there's, a, there's also a saying, uh, God created the earth, and uh, the, the Dutch, they uh, created the, the Netherlands or Holland. Yeah. Um, but actually, this picture uh, um, shows the opposite, actually. Maybe at, like, the human time scale, the, the, the sort of scale we look at, you can say, okay, we have this situation of floods in 53, and there's a lot of uh, um, uh, um, instability in the landscape, and we have dikes and dams to deal with that, and we have the power to control the situation. But if you look at this larger time scale, you see that, that well, actually, we destroyed it. We, we, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the point is, we are now, uh, our current condition is that we are experiencing a major tilt mm. uh, at the planetary scale. Uh, we see it all around us. Uh, maybe coronavirus is also uh, a form of it. Uh, but climate change, uh, melting ice caps, etc. you know the drill. Um, and um, we are continuing to trying to use our technology, even more technology, more control, trying to sort of maintain the situation, control it again. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of spinning even more out of, out of control. So isn't it just time to just take our hands off, take a step back, and perhaps let other uh, non-human actors uh, or non-Western thinkers, uh, uh, yeah, lead the way and uh, um, sort of show where 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 we could go. Yeah. Yeah, the occupation of the environment. It says um, this is an area in also in Zeeland called het verdronken land van Saftingen, and uh, so that means the drowned land of Saftingen. Saftingen is just a name, but. Uh, you would think that if the dikes are gone, everything would flood and uh, it would be basically sea or something. But uh, this is a, sort of the only area in, in uh, Zeeland where there are no dikes. And then what happens is that the river uh, accumulates uh, its sedi sediment. So actually the land rises and uh, it's now the only area that's above sea level. So... Mm. It, yeah, it makes us look a bit stupid. <laughs> but um, so humans are sort of occupying this spot with our short-term uh, investments that we don't want to lose. We don't want to lose those bungalow parks and uh, <laughs> and all the wonderful things of Zeeland. Uh, we want to, um, yeah, the, I guess when you, we've been doing these interviews and what seems to be in the way of progress is... is uh, vested interests. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, that's, that's a it. solemn end of our yeah. <laughs> <laughs> presentation. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, let's have a little clapping. <laughs> <laughs> I like to, you know, I'm one of these people that clings to the new, to the old ways. You know, we have to clap after every presentation. Maybe I can drop that convention. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't want to make it feel forced. Well, thanks for, for that presentation. Um, I think um, you raised a lot of very interesting points, particularly this, okay. Extra claps. <laughs> it's the delay, <laughs> the internet delay. Um, okay. Um, a lot of interesting points about, I think, um, for example, um, this idea of us, t what if we took our hands off the wheel? You know, what if we, but we're too scared to do that. I mean, for obvious reasons, it's, it's something that uh, we can't possibly predict what will happen. We imagine what will happen would only be disastrous for mm. us. But mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's not the case. I mean, I, I imagine you have some examples of where when we do relinquish some control, it's actually quite, and it ends up being beneficial. Well, well this is the example, actually. I think the, the premonition that there is control is problematic. Um, we, as humans, we design uh, and build uh, nuclear power plants, and et cetera, and then we feel in control, but we, something as simple as a, as a plastic bag, we've invented it, mm -hmm. and it's been here for a couple of decades, and we end up with oceans full of this stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Are we in control in that sense? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, we're, we're clearly, 
I think one of the key things that you said was this short-term investment. It's about the short-termism maybe yeah. of the thinking. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, it, what can we do to break out of that? I mean, it's, it's something that's like one of the most difficult problems, I think, of human thinking to the point where it's, you have to really uh, sometimes say, I'm going to think long-term now in order to, to really do it. But is that the only way to kind of force that artificial lens onto it or? That's one way, I think. Um, Maybe I have, a, I have a small quote that I translated from one of the, our interviews, uh, if I may. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Marinus, who is uh, an artist, and he, uh, well, he was a son of a, uh, like a lighthouse keeper uh, in Zeeland. Uh, it's uh, from the same project. And, um, uh, well, he has been playing with the dunes since he was a child, and he is now older. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and he is still playing a lot with the dunes. He's making a lot of uh, very, uh, very nice and interesting artworks. Um, and for this project, um, uh, we were looking for a way to talk or sort of communicate with the dunes also and try to get uh, some insights from what, uh, what, what kind of new ideas, new, new questions do we get when we listen to non-humans like the dunes. Um, uh, for concerning this kind of questions that you were asking. And um, yeah, one thing he said I, I really liked, uh, I'm gonna quote it now, it's about dune time. Um, we as humans look at a moment in time, perhaps that of a few generations. That is a time frame uh, we find uh, important, something we can grasp, something we can relate to. But the dunes don't have that. They are timeless, they don't have birds, they don't die. So basically they don't have time. Um, so in dune time, humans are just a fraction. And look at the fraction we are. I mean, in 2000 years, which is just a fraction actually. That, uh, for example, Holland completely changed. So yeah, that is one example. Uh, another one maybe, uh, just to give a second quote from uh, Frank, Frank, Frank. Um, he, uh, yeah, we interviewed him for the harbor porpoise, which is a small whale dolphin kind of creature which lives in the uh, Oosterschelde. And he said, um, we, uh, from talking from the perspective of, the, of this uh, animal, he said, we as humans uh, make our livelihoods more and more impossible by all this trying to control stuff. Um, and the harbor porpoise uh, would probably laugh at the short term sightness of us humans. So I think this is like uh, talking with these people who have strong, uh, yeah, uh, long term observations with these animals and non humans. This, this, this kind of insights is what we get back uh, from talking to these uh, non humans. Uh, and I think it's quite strong, uh, strong messages, actually. I think um, these sort of uh, vested interests or short-term interests are uh, maybe also goal-related. So you have your, your personal goals. And um, as an artist, you know, you like to... I like to have a sort of playful approach to things. And um, there was uh, research done by um, Kenneth Stanley, who uh, works in... Um, artificial intelligence and he there's a sort of test where you have your uh, neural network try and find the way through a maze and if you if you make a, a sort of classic uh, neural network you try to sort of train it to get to the other point to the uh, and maybe so in maybe 40 tests about 3 would be a good result if three of these uh, networks end up at the end point. Um, what, what Stanley was doing was a completely different approach where he was looking to give these neural networks the ability to search for novelty. So they didn't have, have a, they di he didn't program them or, or design them to find the end point or any other goal. The goal was to, vi to find uh, novelty. And when he re tried 40 runs with those uh, types of neural networks, 39 found the, the endpoint. So um, that's, 
when I read that, I feel sort of vindicated. I think, yeah, you see, uh, it's on the right track where <laughs> playfulness is good. Uh, I think that that could be one one aspect where this kind of practice might help uh, in these kinds of situations to to um, to encourage playfulness and. Um, and to warn against uh, working towards goals. Hmm. And as artists um, and researchers, how do you, what, 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 can, what else can we do to maybe create narratives that come from more the non-human point of view, the Dunes point of view, or some hmm. other point of view? It seems quite rare, actually, and I just kind of wonder if you have any other insights into how we might get there. I think it's quite uh, difficult to really get to mm. what uh, they are saying or, I don't know, what they are becoming because you don't know, the dunes don't really have a voice Our in that. Guess, in yeah. There. yeah, so it's uh, observation uh, at the long term. Uh, it's playfulness, I think, a lot, uh, as Tone says. Um, yeah, but I, I, think, I think we're, well, Maybe we're just starting to see that there is a lot of uh, lessons to be learned uh, mm -hmm. at places where we didn't look before. Um, yeah, I think it's, it would be a very good idea to start uh, listening more to the different narratives. Yeah, so maybe about cultivating like a culture of listening more. Yeah. Talking less. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Talking less, yeah. 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 Especially that. Especially that, yeah. Yeah. I would. Uh, my I have two reactions to being being inspired by non-humans in a way, or being informed by them. Um, it's very hard, I think. To I find it very hard to uh, not patronize an animal or a plant. Mm. I'm never quite sure if I take the appreciate them fully. It's, that's a hard thing to do, I, th I think. And uh, for society uh, as, as we live in, I think we're a long way off that. Um, so that brings me to the second part of my reaction. Um, Sean Wilson wrote a small book which stood very lonely in a university um, library in New Mexico. It's a tiny little book and it says... Um, Research is ceremony, and yeah. um, Sean is a, comes from an indigenous background, and um, he writes that research is the, is the ceremony of um, staying accountable to all your relations. Hmm. So, through, so research is, in a way, um, showing you your... Um, is a way to confront yourself with all your the accountability you have for all the things around you. So all your relations in the Native American context means your forefathers, the people that come after you. Um, so seven generations before you, seven generations after you. It's not just your re human relations, it's the non-human relations and it's the, uh, yeah, the, the landscape, all of these things. and. Uh, it, it, it's been inspiring, that little book, um, to feel that research could be that. So it, it's kind of confronting the researcher with the question, who are you to do this research? Mm. And if I stay close to that, I feel that I'm sort of, that I'm not uh, insulting the, the, the objects or people or situation that I'm researching. Great. Um, I don't think we, I'm getting any signals that there are any questions in the audience. It's a little hard for me to, yeah. to see, but if anybody has uh, anything, we can also uh, move on maybe to the next speaker. Um, so thank you. Thank Darko you. And Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, and now we're going to move on to Suzanne Daliwal, who's uh, with us on Zoom. And who... Uh, well, I'll, I'd like to warmly welcome you to the stage. I wish you could see how you were present here um, because it's a really cool setup, Suzanne. Welcome, very, welcome to uh, the festival. 
Hi, uh, welcome. No, sorry. <laughs> so I'll just let you introduce yourself and, and kick things off, uh, if that's all right with you. And, uh, and then uh, we'll manage the questions uh, to you, uh, mediated through time and space um, once your session is over. So great. Thanks. Uh, it's really great to be here and it's been an incredible conversation already with the Fiber Festival um, to be in dialogue about these themes. Um, my name is Suzanne Daliwa. I'm a artist activist. Um, I move between being um, working with invisible materials such as markets and economies and shifting them away from extractive industries through direct action and campaigning. Um, and I also work with art as a way to bring attention to the front lines of the extractivism, which is fueling a lot of the climate crisis. Personally, I am not indigenous. I am British Indian, but for the last 15 years, I've been working as an ally, as someone who holds British and Canadian passports to elevate and amplify um, frontline communities, as we know, most of the fossil fuels that we need to keep in the ground um, happen to lie on indigenous territories. So, um, and my research has also worked around the space of trying to understand what is the culture of activism itself. Um, and as a woman of color in that space, how the forms of activism um, create barriers and, and boundaries to participating in that. So I have um, a presentation. I'm just going to bring that to view. Is that good? Yeah. OK, so I really was great to hear about the, you know, the emphasis on listening. Um, this is actually a megaphone. And I rewired the megaphone in order to really sort of pay attention and, and to bring attention to the fact that so much of my practice is about listening to the front line. Um, before I take action, there's a lot of process of consultation, of listening to Indigenous communities, of understanding the possible implications of that work. So I actually, you know, reverse engineered this megaphone to sort of make visible some of the processes that we don't often see when we just see the, the banners in the street and everything that's happening there. So most of my work for the last 15 years has been focusing here. This is the Alberta tar sands. Um, the Alberta tar sands is one of the largest sites of extraction on the planet. Um, this is the boreal forest. We often hear about the Amazon forest, but the um, boreal forest is one of the largest um, carbon sinks on the planet and it's also the second fastest rate of deforestation happening and the oil that is being um, extracted from here is heavy oil it's not you know the silky smooth oil it's heavy oil it's unconventional oil it takes three to five barrels of oil uh, natural gas to extract this and what is left is nothing short of ecocide um, these landscapes which were once you know pristine uh, traditional territories of indigenous communities um, are left like this and these uh, landscapes can never be remediated in our lifetimes or in the next seven generations as we heard mentioned before um, instead they are sites of ecocide and, and Polly Higgins who's a lawyer who recently sadly passed away has worked very hard to have the crime of ecocide um, recognized so again this is just a another picture of what this looks like. We often think about the climate crisis as something in the future, some Blade Runner-esque scenario. Um, however, in reality, um, you know, this is happening right now. The tar sands has been extracted for 50 years already. Susan, but because sorry, yeah. can, I, can I just cut in for a second? Um, can you try to share your screen? Because I don't think we're seeing. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Holly I, I know I don't have the the 360 degree view here, so I'm not sure if anyone else can see it, but I don't think so. So let's. Uh... Oh, that's sad. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, is is it sharing now? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so hopefully yeah, so my. Just show us, the, show us the beautiful megaphone. 
Yeah, so here we go. Here's the megaphone. <laughs> and that's the, the reverse engineered. And this is the, the tar sands. The tar so sands. Is... Okay, now we're back in the tar sands. Yeah. Okay, hopefully my descriptions have painted a picture. Yes, no, it's been painting a vivid, vivid picture for me, but uh, yeah, we need to yeah. see, have the slides in the space. Sorry. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, this is the site of Ecoside, um, and it's happening currently now. But because this was the territory of Indigenous communities within Canada, um, we often think as Canada as this liberal playground. However, you know, it continues to enact um, genocide and racism towards its Indigenous people. So there was a complete silence, radio silence on this that was happening. Um, and as I mentioned, most of my work has been around this site of indigenous rights and extractivism, um, the humanitarian implications of that. Um, and when I saw what was happening in the tar sands, um, I was really lucky to meet the indigenous environmental network and frontline communities who were working there. And we realized that what we needed to do was to internationalize the situation um, and so we started doing some direct action in the UK back in 2009 and we found that, um, you know, using this imagery, we could really have an impact of, you know, sort of creating an echo chamber where actions that happened in the UK um, reverberated to Canada and all of the design process um, was done in consultation. For instance, even this logo with the drippy flag, first it had a, a black um, drip coming from the maple leaf. However, the chief of the community said, you know, this needs to be a red uh, drip because it's our blood. This is blood oil. So, you know, even though this looks like a lot of the activism you see now, um, this was, a, this was, you know, back in 2009 and there was a lot of deep consultation and collaboration around this work. Um, and also the idea was to expose how colonialism has never ended. Um, it's just changed face. And now it's oil companies um, and it's corporations and banks that are fueling that process. Um, so as well as doing, you know, campaigning and blockades, shutting down BP petrol stations, shell petrol stations, we also engaged in a lot of um, creative campaigning. And I think that was a way to broaden the narrative and the reach outside of the normal climate um, activism space. This was a hat that we commissioned for uh, Kate Middleton when she was traveling across Canada. Um, and we had this in Grazia with banner ads. There was actually 10 of these hats. I wore this to a lot of Halloween parties. It was really fun. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Actually a, a duck um, and one of the ducks that, so when, animals land on the water at the tar sands that you saw that they instantly die um th that water is you know it's non-cleanable there are cannons that fire every minute to alert the animals to move them off there so it is literally a war on the land that we are seeing there so as well as corporations and banks we did a job around trying to expose how the canadian and uk government were trying to undermine climate legislation um, through trying to block transport fuel in Europe. And sometimes these transport fuel legislations are very boring, long EU parliament processes. And so my job was really to think about how do we make this interesting, engaging? How do we shine a light on this revolving door between industry, banks, the Canadian government? Um, and so this was a collaboration we did with Lucy Sparrow. She's a felt artist. Um, she makes all sorts of wonderful things, whole shops and sex shops out of felt. Um, and we worked with her on this to make the felt impacts of the tar sands and bring it to the doorstep of the Canada House when some of these negotiations were happening. Um, and for me, again, you know, this might look like some of the actions you see at the moment, but the focus was also on inclusivity you know in london how can we make sure that immigrants and folks who can't take direct action could be involved in this so i would hold sewing sessions at my house where people could sew and be involved and we could have conversation um, and and bring people into that um place as well and again always working with collaboration so that we're understanding the climate crisis and how the situation is seen um, from those outside of that space and this is just, you know, again, this is back in 2010. So a lot of my work is also archiving climate 
activism history because there's been a real recent co-option. You know, a lot of movements like XR have studied our work and our movements and turned them into activism, um, whereas there's this deep history of this organising that's been happening. Um, so this was outside the Royal Bank of Scotland. And when we're calling for for investment to take be taken out of projects like the tar sands and its pipelines. We're not just calling for an end to those projects, we're also asking for an end to um, projects that don't have the pre prior and informed consent of communities. And that's a real big theme in our work, that projects that don't have consent of communities also need to stop. Um, yeah, and this is uh, the, the Shell AGM. So we did a lot of work around Royal Dutch Shell, um, and as our network grew, we also did solidarity work with those in the Gulf Coast of Mexico impacted by the BP spill. Um, and as a small organization, and this is, you know, the nonprofit industrial complex, often um, it's hard to get the resources to frontline communities. So we're constantly working with innovative ways. Um, this was a pop-up photo exhibition that we did outside the Shell AGM. We bought shares and went in and try to bring attention and the voices of those impacted into those spaces. Um, some of the work we also did was around, has been around um, sh uh, the sponsorship of the arts. And um, this was back in 2010. Again, looking at, you know, how do oil companies get the social license to operate? And that's by sponsoring um, galleries. And this was actually just after the Deepwater Horizon spill and BP was part of a summer party. Um, and so we went inside, we had a little spill. Um, and, and there was a question actually, there was a tension that it was actually then Mexican immigrant workers who had to clean up this action. Um, and that's something that I've been very conscious about as well is how can we really make sure that the, you know, our actions are a microcosm of the world that we're trying to create. So we have to think about, you know, all of these considerations when we're doing our actions um, in addition to the uh, banks and corporations, we've also recently been looking at insurance. Um, and another strategy for speeding up divestment is to also cut insurance to these projects. If projects aren't underwritten, um, they can't go ahead. So, you know, as I mentioned, my work really is moving through exposing these, these pipelines of money um, and thinking up of ways of how to um, expose them and reveal them. And again, also constant, constantly looking for ways to um, bring that in. But one of those challenges that I faced and why I had to be an artist in this work is to expose the way that activism culture itself works. Um, often, you know, there's a co-option of our movements and most recently with Extinction Rebellion, um, you know, it's, it's made it very difficult for the strategies that we use to continue. So we have to also look at activism as a culture, the forms it employs, um, and to think about how is that going to work for a culture of activism in the future. Right now in the UK, um, XR is considered a terrorist organization. And so for those of us who are of color, um, that means that some of the forms and the strategies that are deployed um, won't work for our communities as we are already vulnerable to that. So we need to have real conversations about what is the culture of activism? What are the forms that it takes? And how are we gonna be able to do the labor of organizing itself? Um, you know, for our communities, um, a lot of the actions aren't always just protests. This was a healing walk that happened through the tar sands where we prayed um, for the water. And so there's a real, a lot of my work too, as I mentioned, is archivism. So looking at the environmental justice history, you know, people think that the climate crisis was created, you know, the last two years or climate activism, but that's just the mainstream popularization. So we have to look at our ancestors like Ken Sarawiwa, who were poets and playwrights, but also led the Ogoni people. And we need to look at that ancestry to understand how we're going to get to the future, because that's where, um, you know, a lot of the work lies. And this was a, um, a steel sculpture that was made by Sakari Douglas Camp. Um, and I worked with her when, for the 20th year anniversary of the execution of Ken Sarawiwa, um, the Agoni people wanted this bus to come home um, as an act of solidarity between the people of the UK who had built this bus and it had the name of the Agoni Nine on it. 
Um, but it was actually um, impounded by the Nigerian government before it actually reached there. Um, so my work as a, as a curator is, was to turn the absence of that bus into its presence, to use that to try and negotiate with the Nigerian government um, for the cleanup of, um, of, of, of the devastation that's happened in there. So even, and it also got this message um, of the Agoni Nine to a whole new generation who were suddenly like, save the bus, save the bus. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, as again, constantly working in collaboration to to find the resources to get over this hurdle of the the lack of resources we often have within the climate movement so this was with john daniel he's sadly passed on he was a, a designer who did a lot of artwork for funkadelic and different jazz artists so we we make these posters and often there can be a block in the media a mainstream media getting these stories across so we often have to utilize um, digital media to get those out. So this actually went viral on Nigerian radio. Um, and that was a way then we were able to then get it into Al Jazeera and get it into the news. Um, and the other part of my work is, you know, a lot of the content we make is also like by indigenous people for indigenous people. So this is the indigenous environmental network. Um, we have a channel that can reach up to a million people at times. And I think that's a part of decolonizing this work as well, that we also try and make content that is, you know, for us, by us. And as again, as I mentioned in the recent, um, you know, past, um, there's been a, a white supremacy in the way that we communicate about climate change and, you know, all respect to what Greta is and what she's been doing. But it's really erased a lot of the youth who've been doing this work. So I've been finding, again, digital strategies to bring um, our voices in, to make sure that we're not erased from that space. And that's a real question moving forward about how we're gonna honor um, resource and, 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 and undo the harm of the last two years of, of white supremacy in climate communications. Um, so a lot of my work now looks at, you know, how do we recenter the hyper real estate it's not a real word, I made that up. <laughs> and the digital divide, um, you know, how do we use digital communications that right now there's a lot of climate noise, there's a lot of eco influencers, you can, you know, sign up to an eco modeling agency and you can um, wear eco products and you can have hundreds of thousands of followers, yet crises that need our attention, such as the Cyclone Ampham, which happened in May, um, didn't even reach on the radar. You know, that was the whole entire 10 million people were displaced by Cyclone Ampham. Um, it was the entire uh, North India, Bangladesh, Bhutan. So we really have a question about how we're going to create um, climate communications that actually connect us to the front line, that make sure we get the right stories out and also um, are in service of those movements that are on the front line. Um, so this was an action, this just happened yesterday actually um, at Somerset House. Um, I worked with um, a duo, Yara and Davina, and we had these arrivals and departures um, screens where it was the birth dates of um, you know, activists or environmental justice ancestors who are here in those past. So we used those to you know, honor um, and to bring forward that memory and that legacy. And, and for me, particularly, it's about bringing that legacy to communities of color so that we understand um, where we've been in the climate crisis, so that we know where to go um, and that we don't have to um, endure a lot of the racism that we have to go through in climate activism itself um, and that we can build movements and, and create movements as well. Thank you. Yeah, let's clap. Let's clap. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne, for that inspiring talk. Um, and um, yeah, well, we'll open it up to, to questions, but I thought I would kick it off just uh, by asking you to maybe talk a little bit more about, um, it seems that uh, with all of these approaches, there's a real, uh, there's a sophistication to the aesthetic and a very targeted nature to the kind of communication um, that you're trying to do. How do you, um, can you maybe dive into that a little bit more? I mean, I just, that duck hat is never going to leave my, my memory. <laughs> you create these very effective, uh, evocative uh, images and you use that to, 
to cut through the kind of white noise of mainstream media and get get attention. Um, where where do these inspirations come from? Like obviously, there's like a a legacy. Um, as a fellow Canadian, I instantly recognize Adbusters and and these kinds of um, kind of the ancestors, you could say, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the preceding uh, groups who have worked in this manner. But tell us more about the aesthetic inspirations and how you really use those tools. Yeah, um, I think the things that inform me the most is that actually going to the tar sands and, and bearing witness, you would be surprised how many um, folks work on these issues and they've never actually walked through these Spaces, smelt them, rec you know, witness, bed witness, témoignage to that, what's happening there. So with the ducks, it was definitely from walking on the ground um, and, and processing the trauma of witnessing that. And then the other part of it is, you know, even though I'm a climate activist, my I love pop culture, like I'm, I'm watching trash, I'm listening to pop music. And so I'm really interested in forms that break that divide um, and bring, you know, my, my friends or ordinary folks into that conversation. So I think that merging of the experience of being there, of thinking about how to um, you know, reach fashion, how to reach those spaces is, is definitely part of it. Great. Um, maybe it would be also interesting to hear um, a little bit more. I mean, the, the term ecocide is also very evocative and um, uh, maybe extreme on purpose to, to sort of uh, really, is that, is that also part of your communication toolkit, would you say, is to kind of create um, the language that, that is needed for us to understand the urgency of the situation? Yeah, I think, I mean, ecocide itself is um, a proposition for a fifth crime against peace alongside genocide. Um, so that's the legal terminology that is being deployed for that. So it, it sounds extreme because it is. Um, and there's a very specific uh, criteria for that. For instance, the Gulf Horizon spill wasn't ecocide because it's recoverable in a certain number of generations. However, the tar sands um, is non-recoverable. However much Shell tries to say you can use carbon capture storage, all these techno-freak solutions, um, it's not recoverable. <laughs> So that is ecocide. In terms of the language, I think what I found is that, you know, at the beginning we were quite hyperbolic, like everything was dripping and oil. And, and then I found that actually, I think it can work against us because we don't need to be hyperbolic. Um, the facts themselves, the impacts themselves speak themselves. And I think that's the crisis that we're in right now, especially with the communications coming out of XR. Um, sometimes they're so hyperbolic, scientists have actually asked for certain uh, pieces of content to be taken off the internet because they're working against the science and creating a sense of an alarm that can move people out of action and disconnect us from the strategy. So I, I, that's why I try and work with the strange too, um, like those duck, the, the felt action sort of pulling on the idea of it's strange enough to bring your attention to it. Um, and that's also a strategy to avoid getting arrested. <laughs> How can I make it strange enough that the Guardian will come out and take a picture, but also I'm not making myself arrestable. <laughs> That's a key tip, yeah, how to, how to not get arrested so you can keep doing the work, right? So that you can keep doing the work. Well, thanks very much, uh, Suzanne. Um, thank you. And uh, stay, of course, with us because we'll, uh, we're going to have a big Q&A at the end. But right now we're going to move on to our next virtual speaker uh, who's directly behind me, Anab Jain, uh, designer and futurist. Uh, looks like she's now... Uh, split across two screens. <laughs> it's really funny what's happening with you here, Anab, um, but it's great. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm just really blown away by both the talks before me. So, um, yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to, yeah, like I said, share my screen and then. Okay. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so I'm just going to, um, um, I got a kind of a format from Yale and I'm going to follow that format. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce myself by saying that I run a studio called Superflux with my partner, John Arden, and a team of great colleagues. Um, the work we do is not about so fixated with the future as a strict linear progression, but we start, um, we, we, we think about the future as being old. Uh, and and we, we think about the future as, as being a, um, not a fixed destination, but a, a sort of constantly shifting and unfolding space of future potential. And um, so essentially, this is just a glimpse of some of the, some of the projects that we do. We, we say we design tangible, visceral, experiential features, um, focusing not on prediction, but on creating as many possible features as possible and making them tangible. Um, we know that the future cannot be seen, but it can be imagined. And if those imaginations can be seen, touched, smelled, heard and experienced, then maybe that opens the door to potential possibilities, options, choices. And, 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 and we find that quite empowering. Um, and so um, it kind of is built on the idea that if people are able to step into a potential future, does that help them consider consequences of their actions in ways that they cannot, uh, because, you know, as you were talking in the first presentation about this distance, this kind of huge distance between the now and the present, which, which stops people from seeing themselves directly in the future. Um, the way we do this is through many, many processes around sense making, looking at weak signals, look, looking at those tiny bits of noises out, out, and then following a lot of intuitive hunches um, finding threads of possibility um, and then trying to find uh, ways to join those threads of possibility to create rich tapestries of these future worlds. Um, and I'm going to just share a project that is more relevant to something that y'all uh, talked about, like uh, the focus on climate. It's also been the focus of our work for the last few years, a uh, project called Mitigation of Shock, um, where we actually, as y'all said, wanted to try and condense this vast amorphous form of the climate change hyper object into something recognizable, tangible, understandable. Um, and it all started with this familiar graph from NASA showing um, our shattering progress in warming up the planet. But beyond the single vector of temperature rise, there are many more complex problems, uh, such as projections that by 2050, that per capita food consumption will grow from 32 kilos today to 52 kilos in the future. None of these things are presented in graphs like this. And it also, these graphs also do not show how people might actually, what, 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 what will the lived reality be like? Um, people are often at a loss when it comes to making sense of such graphs. And so based on such projections, we began exploring one possible future where the Western world has moved from abundance to scarcity. Uh, we imagine living in a future city with repeated flooding, periods with almost no food in supermarkets, economic instabilities, um, broken supply chains. Um, some of, 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 of a faint hint of that we already experienced uh, in the lockdowns. So what can we do to not just survive, but prosper in such a world? What food can we eat? Um, to really get inside these questions, we started doing a ton of live prototyping. We imagine a lot of our homes will become spaces for food production. And so we started building food computers from scratch. Um, but we wanted to build them in the cheapest way possible. So we started using salvaged, abandoned and repurposed materials, turning today's waste into tomorrow's dinner. Um, this is John here. Uh, who, who had never built a food computer before, but obviously that was a great challenge. And so, you know, there was a lot of trial and error, uh, but we were trying to build this using what he's trying is fog phonics. So using just nutrient fog, no soil or even water uh, in an indoor situation to grow things really quickly. Um, it was relentless and we had our, you know, kind of share of Fair, fair amount of accidents, but, uh, but, but, but we, we landed in a good place, I think. <laughs> and so the final outcome took the form of this installation, uh, in an, uh, which transported people into a London flat, perhaps around 2050 or so, when my son would be around my age. At first glance, a seemingly comfortable living space designed for a world of 
automated living, global trade, and material abundance. But then on closer inspection, a realization that the apartment had been adapted to a future it was never meant to inhabit. The sounds of a radio show and discarded newspapers started to reflect the tensions of this new world. A smart panel was constantly asking the fridge to refill milk, but where was the milk in this future? Amongst the detritus of now obsolete smart devices and um, designer goods lives a new reality transformed by the impact of climate change. Recipes in the kitchen reflect changes in food production, storage, and consumption. Experimental food production now occupies space once given to relaxation, transforming the apartment into a space for growing and producing food. Resourcefully hacked together consumer items, IKEA shelves, decorative fog makers, computer fans, programmable microcontrollers, plumbing supplies, LED lamps, fog oozing through these contraptions, mycelium growing amongst them, amongst all the other vegetation, spirulina, um, yeah, lots of different contraptions producing food and looking out beyond, you see a city familiar yet alien. Oh, over 100,000 visitors came to the apartment at CCCB in Barcelona where it lived for a few months. The important thing about such work is that it's not a prediction, but it's not a render either. Um, the intention of such a speculative approach with hands-on experimentation is that it offered us the opportunity to very directly step into a familiar space to confront our fears, but also to show concrete ways in which we can mitigate the shock of climate change. And so if such kind of work, if our work becomes a catalyzing force for people to imagine things that they would not have been able to imagine otherwise, then that's powerful. And for me, that's a form of slow critical activism. And more importantly, uh, this is not a one-off. Uh, um, the second episode opened at the Art Science Museum in, 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 in Singapore, on, curated by Anna Agar and Adrian George. So here in this apartment in Singapore, we moved away from the dependence on tech to create even more simpler and easier techniques to grow food. We applied a very permaculture-based approach adapting principles of circular farming, reuse of waste, companion planting, and soil health to create a sort of per permanent multi-species indoor agriculture system in a situation where outdoor farming is not anymore an option. Um, and so the home became this multi-species microcosm um, rather than things growing on the periphery as artisanal food, you live through and amongst them. Another thing we started doing was to meticulously craft tools for gathering, snaring, capturing, consuming, and growing food. So these are spears made from discarded Arduino, circuit boards, and whittled bamboo. So these kinds of repurposed electronics, mechanical and plastic remnants, all the ways of the Anthropocene now finds a new ritualistic purpose. And looking out, you see a very different, very humid Singapore. And so while extreme weather conditions have changed the world as we know it, we also wanted to show that it's the sheer ingenuity of, of the inhabitants, the tools, the artifacts, the plants and companions and new ways of living that start to tell a hopeful story of extreme adaptation in a post-climate change future. And so the question is often asked is why was it important to create such a detailed level of visceral embodied form of experimentation and scene setting. The thing is with global warming, the current political landscape feels extremely polarized. It's either that global warming exists led by someone whom I refuse to name, or there is complete apocalypse, AKA the end of the world. As we sway between doom and denial, we are stuck in what Lauren Ballant calls a state of impasse a moment where existing social imaginaries and practices no longer produce the outcomes they once did, but no new imaginaries or practices have yet been created. Philosopher Isabel Stengers writes how such a state of impasse is actively produced by managers of the status quo or the guardians. These guardians actively produce a situation 
where it becomes impossible to imagine anything other than the status quo. And Stengel continues, when choices are presented by guardians, they are infernal alternatives. A series of non-choices presented as choices. So the choice between doing nothing about climate change or geoengineering the climate, the choice about doing nothing about deforestation, or the choice to treat forests as commodities in order to preserve the value. So in this kind of a situation, people are left with a cold panic, an important fear of the future, functionally demobilizing people. And so the question that we grapple with is, how do we resist the gravitational pull of the impasse and deflect these invisible sources of power? How do we imagine different worlds within our current political landscapes? With our practice and stories of like mitigation of shock, we want to talk about stories of extreme adaptation emerging in precarity, emerging in instability, and thriving in the blasted ruins of capitalism. It may be the end of the world as we know it, but other worlds are possible. And you know, it's this is all, it sounds great, but I know it from, from, from our practice that this is an impossible thing. But we find that it is so difficult for people to imagine alternatives because whenever they see a particular instantiation of the future, if it does not align with their ideological point of view, it is dismissed as a prediction or something that's impossible. The possibility of sitting with discomfort of uncertainty and being open to multiple views of the world is difficult. Our prospective brains are just not trained to maintain multiple worlds and views when simultaneously being forced by media to all the time to hear and see what, what is being told. Um, and so I kind of kind of like to talk about this as, as, as framing this idea of sitting with uncertainty, not as some kind of a meme or a, a, you know, motivational quote, but as a practice that allows us to see these possibilities and to try not retreat from the ache. And I feel that one way of doing that is through cautionary tales and um, fiction and so on. And this is my constant sketch of trying to reframe what is known as the futures cone, um, which I'm not um, there yet. <laughs> um, but when I was, when we were, when I'm sorry to think about some of these things and I work with mitigation of shock, I was reminded of something that my friend Anne Galloway thinks a lot about. Questions like, what if we deny that human beings are exceptional? What if we stop speaking and listening only to ourselves? And it was around the same time that the mushrooms in our studio for mitigation of shock, which were long forgotten, bloomed. They were, you know, we were desperately trying to grow them like four years ago in this, in this um, installation and they didn't quite do it. And suddenly they were, and you know, it is interesting because we, you know, these were some of the early days and we were using Arduinos and ultrasonic fog to control the humidity in this DIY polythene clad chamber. Um, and so, so such a long time, nothing happened and we moved them around and then yes, they bloom. And it just brought to me this understanding, which Anna Singh writes a lot about that. It was our human activities and our disturbances both planned and unplanned that had created the optimum conditions for these mushrooms to grow into these beautiful and quite delicious forms. And that's when I realized that mitigation of shocks are giving birth to new things for us as designers, especially, you know, not just make things, but make things that grow. You know, of course, foresters grow trees and farmers grow wheat, but within our world of design, the focus on the product or the artifact has always been the embodiment of an outcome. So here we began to instead focus on the organism rather than the artifact. By suspending, you know, pots with nutrient fog, roots were born, they died, ecologies were evolving, and we became participants in this very complex human and non-human relationship. Which is when I'm reminded of um, Donna Haraway's idea of multispeciesism, you know, if we can move beyond quick fixes, we become open to the strange and the unknown, the ambiguous and the uncertain, the weird and the provisional. 
Um, Richard Powers writes about this in his wonderful book, Over Story, that there are no individuals in the forest, no separable events. The bird and the branch it sits on are joint things. A third or more of a food of a big tree may go to feed other organisms. Even different kinds of trees form partnerships. Cut down a birch and a nearby Douglas fir may suffer. So what does this mean? It means that attacking people with different views is the same as attacking yourself for feeling differently about something on a different day. Or realizing that stripping an ecosystem, the natural resource that everyone depends on, is tantamount to cutting a piece of flesh in order to feed yourself. We are a collective body of many parts, both inside and out. By seeing the self not as an individual hero, but as one among many human and non-human species, a new kind of tentacular, multi-kind, multi-species politics of care might emerge. A politics which does not rely on oppositional, binary, artificially constructed worldviews, one that is not obfuscated by the left or the right or the neoliberals and the communists or whatever you choose to follow. A politics that gives us a new kind of relational agency to help us imagine alternatives for living with and through global warming. A politics which gives us an opportunity to invent new practices of more than human care, humility, imagination, interdependence, resistance, revolt, repair, and mourning. And through all this work and research, this is a very ongoing work in progress, where I'm trying to, it's just the starting point of what I call a field guide for a more than human politics, there's various perspectives that we have which are very human and anthropocentric to move, moving towards a more than human perspective and starting to see the world in a different way. Um, and I just want to conclude with something that Bayo Akumalfe writes that the times are urgent, let us slow down. The times are urgent, let us weird up. The times are urgent, let us play. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was great. Um, I was really intrigued by many uh, points that you made in your talk, but um, I think I would certainly like to hear more uh, from you about this. Um, you mentioned the design creating fixed products and uh, the image of the mushrooms blooming is uh, quite a nice one. Um, maybe you could speculate a little on uh, some future directions for design creating evolving products or, or look back on, on other examples where that was um, the case and how that might be the key to unlocking something that uh, activates different tendencies in us. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, was that, <laughs> was that throwing you a really tough, uh, tough one to start? <laughs> I apologize. Oh, gosh. Um, You've stimulated my brain and ab so much. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, it, this is a very good, really, really good question, something I grapple with and something because I teach in a department that used to be known as industrial design and now we are calling it design investigations. And um, so um, I think, you know, I remember something that um, I can't remember, was it Lebius Woods or someone had said, you know, that we are designers are part of the problem that, you know, um, and it is, it is, mm. it is very, very challenging that how do you start defining the role of your own profession from within while knowing how deeply inter interconnected it is with the economy. And, you know, like I can't tell my students don't go and get design jobs mm. because they need to pay their bills. So it's this kind of, I, I think, I think the way forward, I do believe, is to really consider the bigger uh, second, third level consequences of the design and the products we create. But I also wonder if we can think of some more stealth tactics uh, of trying to infiltrate the organizations within which we work to help them change their perspectives. Can we, you know, in presentations, just, just infiltrate PowerPoints with some slides around the you know future impact or the carbon footprint of that product could 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 designers start adapting stealth tactics to infiltrate um, uh, business models and start proposing new ways of um, um, imagining um, what the future of design is. I kind of feel uh, that 
maybe design as we know it has had its time. Maybe uh, design as we know it is a very 20th century con concept and maybe we really need to rethink what 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 we want to consume and do we what, how we want to design that and and take it from there yeah yeah i think also um another thing you said was about uh how um things become constrained debate becomes constrained between two choices neither of which are maybe the right solution or uh, well who's to say what the right solution is anyway so um you know this is also maybe something do you find that tendency i, I certainly see quite a lot of it um in terms in in the, the fields i work in um uh of like this you know seeking solutions and they're being present you're being presented with um basically uh two bad options but nobody stops to look at the at the middle way or is design finally breaking through getting out of this yeah, this yeah, it's such yeah, it's such a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, I think the problem with design is the solutionism aspect of it. I think it I I it is you know, I studied in a design school in India where it was very much design is a problem solving um uh, profession. And in certain cases I'm not disagreeing, but I do think that currently, especially the kind of quote unquote problems that we are talking about, I, I just don't think there are solutions in the way it, every solution has a has a, a leads to a problem. You know, if you're saying, okay, this big dam needs to be constructed because people in Gujarat, where I'm from, need water, then the dam has done that, but has displayed hundreds of thousands, even millions of indigenous people and uh, 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 in order for that dam to be constructed. So I think I think what if we were to see these problems as challenges hmm. and, or as interconnected complex uh, challenges that can't have solutions but can have responses to and then what might our responses be and how might we adapt ourselves to be able to shift and change our responses so as to cause minimal harm yeah, exactly. Um, and lastly, I don't want to take up all of the questions, so I'm going to, after I ask you this, open things up a little more. And I think we have some questions on social media. Um, we have at least one. Um, so please, uh, social media people, get, get typing while I'm talking here. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to actually, actually address you as an educator. Um, and say uh, and and hear more about this dilemma. Of course, with we're we're talking to our students, and uh, I also teach, and trying to impart in them the very best of um, the whatever value system that I think um, that I think is valid. You know, so this is again a, a judgment call. But uh, there is, of course, all of the challenges that they face as as young people, um, mm -hmm. which they've been left with. You know, uh, very depleted job market, um, difficult chances of, you know, ever uh, owning a home or even renting a home without 10 roommates. And, you know, things are just pretty difficult. So what, what kind of advice do you give to your students? How do you, how do you try to guide them through this morass? What are some of the key things you've said to them over the years? Uh, um, I try not lie. I think I, I, I have... Uh, my commitment is to not lie and, pres and not present a rosy picture which doesn't exist. And I think uh, sometimes my students say, oh, it all feels quite overwhelming because even though they are coming in first year and they're young, we always give them briefs that are quite complex and we want them to, to think through these complexities. And um, I suppose the only real gift that we can leave them with is that they stay very, they remain curious, they, re they become curious, critical questioning designers. So, you know, they continue to have a real um, nuanced capacity to critically question, but still remain eternally curious about the world and be able to move through it with that curiosity and criticality. Um, that's, that's, that's what I try and I'm, I'm, I'm I just have to hope that they, they will carve out their opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Striking a balance, again, to loop it back to you, Darko, the balance, uh, balancing act. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Let's, uh, let's see what we have on, we have a, was the question on social media for Anab? Yeah. It was for Suzanne. It was for Suzanne. 
Are you still with us, Suzanne? Yeah, I'm here. Great. So we have a question from Ali Still, and her question is asking to know more about your, the response to your campaigns. So what does success look like to you, and how do you measure success? Yeah. Um, when we started back in 2009, I think we were quite naive and we thought if we went to enough Shell petrol stations, enough annual general meetings, we would get them to pull out of the tar sands. And in fact, Shell and BP did pull out of the tar sands some of their larger projects. However, the thing is, then it just means another multinational comes in and buys up the territory or the project. And it also means that that company can get out of the um, accountability of having to clean up. So I think the measures of success have really changed. We need to question if divestment um, is a success. I think definitely building international awareness for the communities on the ground. The fact that now um, we've really recentered that a lot of indigenous communities are front of movement, they're getting um, the ability to challenge Canada, um, but I think we have a long way to go. I think another way that I would measure success would be that um, resources are with Indigenous um, folks and queer people of colour within the movement. Um, so I think it's at this point it's, it's hard to feel success, but I think we definitely can see that there's a climate movement that's talking about social justice at its centre. Um, and that's something that didn't exist a long time ago. So, yeah, it's a, it's a changing um, criteria. Okay, great. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I have another question from Arvid and Marie. I'm not really sure who this is addressed to, but I guess it could be everybody. Mm -hmm. It says, I'm curious that if the goal of design would be to do as little harm as possible, what space is left to take risks or to experiment? Some of the greatest hand can be done from the best intentions, harm can be done from the best intentions. So what are ways in your eyes to juggle our lack of being able to predict the future? Hmm. Go That's on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I can start and then I'll pass to Anab. Um, so I think one thing is that when we think about design and climate change, I think there can be a fetishization of newness and creativity, wanting to make a new app or like something really that brings um, prestige to the designer or the artist. But actually sometimes it's the most about listening, again, the megaphone turned around and coming in service to those who have been leading legal strategies, traditional ecological knowledge strategies for a long time and thinking, how can I bring my skill set, my resources, my white privilege, my um, funding networks that I have access to that context? So I think that that's a real humbling that I think we need to see more of um, and kind of getting away from um, it, the, the ego around of creativity. But at the same time, we're also doing something we've never done before. I've never challenged fascism in times of climate crisis before. So we do need to make that space for um, creativity, but also always thinking about who it serves um, and, and what that looks like. And at the moment, um, creativity and innovation would mean safety for black and brown and queer people. Um, so thinking also about what is our criteria of, of innovation and, and what's needed as well. And we definitely need to have a critical lens around false solutions, um, like carbon capture storage, geoengineering, um, and make sure that, you know, things like land rights, securing access to biodiversity, they're not sexy, um, but they're actually some of the things that we need. So um, rethinking what innovation looks like in this context of ancestral knowledge as well. I mean, you answered it. I, I couldn't agree more, Suzanne. <laughs> that was a great answer. Maybe I can, maybe I can add. Um, I was with a friend called uh, Frank Heckman in, um, with the Maasai people. The Maasai uh, have been the recipients of uh, European uh, 
initiatives, let's say, uh, for, for decades, where there is a continuous cycle of uh, uh, NGOs coming with uh, best intentions and uh, digging wells or for water. Or, uh, and the Maasai say, well, every time the white man comes, there's a new plan. And um, they reached out to Frank because he works with um, communities in difficult situations. And um, so Frank tried to steer away from um, focusing on um, addressing any of their problems. Um, and instead invited them to come together as a Maasai people and talk about their most, um, the, the kind of future they would like. And that became quite empowering. The first day I was there to sort of help facilitate. The first, the first day uh, some people stood up and uh, did long speech speeches. The second day you could start to feel uh, that um, the, the sort of people started to realize they were they could speak their future into being themselves. Mm. And uh, there were no conditions, there were no... Uh, so I think maybe working on that level, of the, at the level of community, might help avoid um, falling into solutionism. So this in intervention that you do uh, causes the next problem, then the next, then the next. Great. Um, I think we might have some questions in the audience here um, at the back. So we have a microphone moving around. Yeah, I have a microphone here. So if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. And yeah. I will come up to you and I will repeat the question for you. So if there's anybody who would like to share something or add something to the conversation, please do. We're also in this very small group, so it's not a big 200 people that you have to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> feel free. Yeah. But also, if there are no questions, then we return to the table, which yeah, is Yeah, of course, fine. Yeah. 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 I will repeat the question because of... Jason would like to hear more about the book, uh, about the seven generations before and in the past. If you could re recap, like revisit that moment and also share a bit more about the book. This is the rerun, yeah. Um, <laughs> the writer is Sean Wilson, and the book is Research as Ceremony. And it's short, it's nice <laughs> and concise. Uh, but he starts, it's interesting, he starts uh, by um, uh, the first chapter is to his sons explaining why he is writing this book and then he gives context of who he is as a researcher, so his background as an indigenous person, his struggle <coughs> to be this in, it, fully in an academic um, environment and then he sort of goes into uh, uh, not writing uh, the kind of text that might be expected of him, and that that's the book. And uh, but yeah, I, I think I said what I, why I liked it. So yeah. Um, you also asked about the seven generations. That's just a, a more general uh, understanding of the world amongst uh, indigenous uh, peoples in North America, and broader, or actually, where um, your responsibility is not to your family, like your children, or your wife, or your husband, and maybe your parents, but much broader. So um, your actions, if they have an impact on seven generations from now, uh, are that's the way you consider your actions. So, um, your morality is expanded over that time period. And uh, the same goes backwards. You inherit 
this kind of morality from seven generations, which is a way, um, yeah, it's a self, it's an organizing principle for a culture, I think. I, yeah, I have a question here. Thank you, uh, Tone, for addressing it. Please. Yeah, it's about the part where Tone talks about it's very hard to not patronize a, an animal or a plant. Yeah. I was just and, um, so, she t Dar Darko talked about uh, those who are coming also in urban context, if I'm saying correct. Can I can we let you try? <laughs> Being, having, I have no, no worries now for having so many different perspectives, like artistic, uh, uh, anthropo and um, what you were saying, and sociological perspectives, uh, bringing that all together. Um, how could you? Yeah, what could be a first step to get away from the patronizing kind of view? Is that correct? All of them. Yeah. I think the last part you should do yourself. We're both wearing a mask, so that's okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, it's way too long question. Yeah. But now I was wondering, since it seems like uh, all of you already have been working with, for instance, indigenous groups. So we might have ideas because I'm thinking like if we only think about the urban context, it might be difficult to connect maybe from an indigenous perspective, but maybe there are some ways in between to already take a first step to get rid of that uh, patronizing way. I don't know if I'm correctly speaking in English, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think the f for me at least, I think a very important step is to uh, uh, re uh, give representation too. So, um, yeah, it's, it's um, in a sort of more um, research method. It's trying to, in your questioning, um, keep an openness to um, all kinds of answers. So not not to ask for how would you deal with this or how would you deal with that or what would be the solution to this, but um, more sort of ontological questioning, uh, like what is, uh, yeah, what is, for example, um, your relation to something or um, how do you experience uh, something like this or for me, that in, in my research, I feel that that is the best way to get like really novel insights that, um, yeah, that, that sort of take my own presuppositions back, uh, way back. So, um, yeah, I think for me, that would be the first step to, to, to ask the right questions. Uh, I think um, for me, what works is to join uh, the space where that uh, animal, plant, or being, uh, where it lives. Yeah. Um, it, it feels like um, I think and act differently when I'm in the presence of uh, this being and its surroundings, because uh, it's in a way an expression of its surroundings. It's what an ecologist would call it a niche. Um, there was a second part I forget, but 
can I add just something? Yeah. So in the research in Zeeland, um, we asked every, um, so, so first of all, talking to the dunes, for example, we, uh, we approached someone who has this really like uh, thinking, feeling relationship with the dunes. Uh, really uh, long-term relationship and a lot of uh, experience observing them, feeling them, whatever. Uh, so uh, that 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 is like in selecting the right person to talk to, also, uh, but also exactly asking the person um, to to meet up and do this conversation in a symbolic place for them, which is like uh, yeah, which has a strong connection to the the subject that you're talking about exactly. So that I think that connects to what Tone says. It's, uh, it gives you way more sort of feeling <laughs> about the subject and about the, uh, um, yeah, the answers and gives, up, uh, gives new, new ideas and questions also. Yeah. Um, in the way you asked your question, you uh, made the distinction between urban space and, uh, well, uh, what's outside of urban? Uh, everything else. Everything else, <laughs> the universe. <laughs> um, Um, I think um, it's maybe even more difficult for us to not patronize uh, a weed that's growing in the street than it is uh, a majestic tree in the rainforest. And I feel that one of the biggest challenges for humans is to appreciate both and to see that... Um, also, the trees next to the car park are, repo are important and not just the ones in a, in a sort of um, national park. Yeah, I have a question here for Anab. Um, first, you started with uh, mitigation of shock in London. Uh, London, in, if I'm correct, 2050. And now Singapore is the second iteration. Um, could you tell us, I think there, 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 there was an interval of maybe one or two years between them. Could you reflect a bit on, of course, the city changes and the context is different, but what happened in that interval of making the first one and the second one on a kind of taking in the global scale and the new impacts? Could you reflect a bit on that, how, how things got different or, or how do you have to also adapt that concept maybe? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, a lot happened, and um, in the first um, iteration, um, it was around 2016, 2017, and I don't know, it felt like um, for a lot of feedback and response that we got was people felt, even though for us it was a kind of a hopeful vision that despite everything falling apart, look, there's a family living here, and um, it felt quite... Um, scary for many people and we could st increasingly start to recognize that in the years that couple of years that everywhere uh, we were surrounded by dystopia so to speak you know the darker the news got darker and darker and it felt like it really started to feel for us that even though we know that we're locked into a certain amount of climate change and it's probably going to be a lot more it's going to be a lot worse than that we are really interested in showing or exploring uh, a more kind of um, a more more than a more than human approach to, to through this challenge. So uh, therefore, um, a shift from uh, a reliance on technological interfaces uh, for growing food systems that we had in Barcelona to completely shifting to uh, quote unquote natural systems or more kind of soil health based systems um, to 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 show the view outside getting increasingly flooded, but a lot more ingenious architecture, um, a lot more kind of um, interplay between human individual agency and, 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 and uh, non-human agency between the state and the individual. What might the state do for you and what might you have to do for yourself? A lot more reflection on communal and community-based networks that you'll see evidences of throughout the apartments. So a lot of learning from the first in order to create the second apartment. And moving forward, we we kind of are now learning from that, uh, exploring far more um, symbolic and kind of poetic ways of talking about these themes 
rather than very immediate direct experiences. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we have two questions from our audience, our offline, uh, of, uh, off, we will call it off-site audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, Rian? Yeah. yeah. We have a question from Amy Shivakuma, and she's, or he, sorry, is curious to know how we can make critical and speculative design more inclusive. So as Adab mentioned, how can we increase participation among countries who are already facing the major brunt of climate change? Um, this is such a good question. Um, um, thank you for asking it. Absolutely, I, and I would I would remove the word design from it because I don't think that speculative and critical work needs to happen through the through the lens of design. I think um, that the work of um, speculate or critical questioning already happens in a lot of places. We are just not aware of it from where from this position here and 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 and. I mean, I would argue even much more so. I think there is this kind of the, the precarity that we sit between between what we know and what we don't know the future to be is that question mark, and that question mark takes a very different form in different places. So those, um, I think, I think if we think about imagining futures as an act of hope, is is an attribute that. Uh, we have all of us have wherever we are and I, I would like to believe that those who are at the forefront of some of these challenges must be living have to have really strong sense of hope in order to be able to face the challenges so i think i i really want to start to think i want to make it much more inclusive in in the way that this thinking is embedded amongst decision makers and those who have the power to be, so it, it is important for those who have the power, the resources, the wealth to be able to see the, the deep level of inequality uh, that, that it exists and, 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 and that, that actually needs to change. Um, the people who are at the forefront of facing these challenges, are, 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 I believe, are critical thinkers. We have another Sorry. question from um, Ali Still, who also is asking you, Anab, um, that you touched on political ideology and how unreceptive we can be to breaking free of that. What post-capitalist way of political grouping does Anab imagine for our future? E.g., how local, how international, how does resource shaping, sharing work, and is there a previous societal grouping in history that would make sense for our future? Oh my God. <laughs> wow. These are all the things in my mind right now. I'm literally grappling with these questions. I, I think that's such a good question, but I don't really have the answer in terms of, I, 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 we are all in the process of imagining what those groupings look like. Um, what do, what is, for me, that is hope. Non-rivalrous non cooperation, which is uh, which moves past, past past ideological division, which uh, which is inclusive, which is uh, which is um, uh, you know which where we are listening, you know, as Suzanne keeps saying, is saying all the time, you know, a really important point, like where we listen to each other, where we um, could be in enormous communities or in communes of 150 people, where we are. Um, we have we have moved past this very uh, again uh, this very extractive capitalist idea where we are using our technologies and our resources um, through interdependence. It's 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 almost an impossible idea, but actually actually um, it's not that difficult if um, if we are able to mobilize if we are able to really. And, and, and I'm, I'm paying a close attention to what's happening in the US right now and the kind of divisive politics that we are seeing. Um, it, 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 is, it, is, um, it, is use, it is it's useful to be able to reflect on that and, and, and see how, you know, simply next time you disagree with someone, how do we stop ourselves from being accusatory? And how can we stop ourselves from being, yeah, it's very difficult, but not, not impossible. Suzanne, maybe you'd like to reflect on that too? Yeah, I think just from the few questions that have just happened, I think, you know, for me, a lot of the work I do around decolonization and 
looking at white supremacy is looking at how we remove a lot of these divisions, you know, for instance, with indigenous people and this, I, you know, a lot of the indigenous folks that I work with are leaders in finance strategy, um, you know, where they're living in modern lives. Like, so this conception of indigenous people also needs to be updated um, so that we're understanding um, how we're approaching the communities that we work with. And I think that leads into the political landscape and understanding that indigenous people aren't just on the receiving ends of the impacts of climate change. They're leading with the sovereignty struggles. You know, 80% of the land that we need to protect is under indigenous lands, either unceded or uh, treaties. So we need to come to those communities. First, we need to decolonize ourselves and come off that um, pedestal we might put ourselves. And that extends to other beings. Like a lot of my work, as I said, I've never faced catastrophic climate change and fascism, you know, the fascism happening in India right now before. And I literally collaborate with the water, um, literally go and, and seek um, ancestral guidance. Um, and when we're talking about future and past generations, it's blurring this idea of time that I'm actually in communication with my ancestors on a financial strategy around Shell. So also getting more interdisciplinary um, and more, um, you know, enabling ourselves to be the polymaths that many of us, are, you know, indigenous and POCs who do this work are. We're financial strategists, we're dreamers, we're poets. So I think the, the spaces of art and why I work in design um, is to make aware and come to attentiveness of the decisions that we make. I think that's why design can help us so much to blur the disciplines again and also to bring those disciplines into conversation within ourselves too. Can I just add, yeah. add one thing is that uh, working with communities, also indigenous commun communities, but also in Amsterdam, um, I think uh, what we do often is when we see sort of a problem like climate climate change or something like that, um, we, see, we say, okay, this is the problem and um, uh, we want to solve it and we're going to communities and we all already have this problem repre representation and then we ask for sort of the solution for that. But for many communities, there are very different problems that are uh, at stake or uh, very much more alive. So sometimes your problem is not the problem of the community you want to work with and you have to just let go of your problem representation and just start trying to see how, for example, you can obtain more land or territory for a community if they want that, for example. So the struggle that, that other people are in is not the same as yours and I think that that is also quite important in the, in the question of how you make it more inclusive. Yeah. Excellent point. Um, I think at this point we should probably wrap up the session because we're now very close to 7 p.m. and the next part of our program for tonight. Um, but just to, to acknowledge all of the speakers and thank them for their wonderful contributions. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in this session, but uh, a lot of the recurring things that seem to have come up revolve around um, the idea of uh, taking care um, in evoking a politics of care and uh, acknowledging, for example, that uh, the, the, we talk about the legacies of colonialism, but actually, as uh, Suzanne said, uh, colonialism never ended. So there's a lot of work that we still have to do, and the cultures of listening that we talked about, I think, are another great uh, tool that we can use to try to push things forward. So thank you to all. Let's uh, have a round of applause. <laughs> I love keeping this physical applause convention, even though we're all scattered all over the place. Um, so now we're going to break for uh, break the conference part for one hour and um, and launch uh, the next part of the program, which is the instability stream. It's uh, one hour of a curated uh, video art, uh, film art program um, that will come on automagically after I stop speaking. And uh, the people here physically, we can all. Um, go out and uh, take a break and, and discuss the events uh, that have unfolded so far. And then after that one hour program, we'll come back in here for our next session, uh, the post-human territories uh, part of the evening. So thank you and uh, see you back here at the table in one hour.
Thank you. Thank you.